Well, it's Frank Dunn, Managing Editor of Infection Control Today, where we aim to give infection specialists the information they need as they battle COVID-19. And one of the ways we do that is by talking to some of the experts in the field. Dr. Dalia Restrepo joins us today. Dr. Restrepo has a truly extensive background in infection control that includes many years practicing in New York City, specializing in general infectious diseases that require hospital care. More recently, she was in New Zealand. New Zealand, you recall, has had arguably the best response to COVID-19 in the world. Dr. Restrepo was a part of that. She was the clinical leader of the infection control team for New Zealand's hospital task force, a task force that focused on stopping COVID in its tracks. You may have seen Dr. Restrepo on television where she is a much sought after expert guest. Dr. Restrepo, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Okay, it's never safe to do a victory dance when COVID-19 is involved. In fact, I heard that there's been one um, spot of a uh, spotting of um, coronavirus in New Zealand as we speak. But um, New Zealand really did have a, arguably the best response in the world. Is there something that you learned over there that you can relate that you can relate to infection preventionists over here that might help them do their jobs better over here? Yes, Frank. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, this is um, really having been a part of the New Zealand experience has been quite a privilege. I can't uh, say that we have done things that are way too different, so to speak, than what infection control or infection preventionists do elsewhere in the world. Um, they do tend to move quite fast here and quite aggressively um, and, and in, in unison. So I think that has really uh, resonated and it really has impacted even a small move when the entire country does it together, it has a lot more impact. So I think the unity is something that um, it, it really might really telling uh, of, of New Zealanders. Uh, I think COVID put us in a different light, that's for sure. Um, infection preventionists are always kind of the quiet folks um, in the back, uh, telling people to wash their hands and use hand sanitizer and ad advocating for standard precautions, but we're not really invited until there's a crisis. So definitely COVID has put us on the spotlight. And I think going forward, um, it is going to be very important and we are having a seat at the table at the moment. Um, in, you know, really for me, um, the environmental and infection preventionists are the pillars of a hospital or an institution because honestly, without that, you really can't function everywhere else properly. Um, so it is important from the moment that you even design uh, a, a, a hospital, it, infection prevention should be on board. I do believe that. Do you see this changing infection prevention forever? I mean, is there a place of infection prevention in the healthcare system in the United States? Will it change it forever? I do believe it will. Um, I think we have a big role in um, education, in um, managing PPE, uh, in implementing policies and, and structures to prevent infection. And I think that with this um, new pandemic, it is really shown a light as to how important it is because it isn't our last pandemic and it won't be the last bacteria, virus, or organism that we'll have to deal with, obviously. We're, we're hoping it'll be the last one that stops everything cold like this one seems. That time. would be very nice. Yes, it would. Yes. We are uh, all suffering tremendously. <laughs> is, is there a, a, an early warning system that you think will be put in place worldwide? I guess it's too early to tell right now. I don't understand early, the question. An infectious disease early warning system that would be put into place worldwide that would spot, spot something like this earlier? Well, I think that would be very important. It's also how we um, have we've amended, right? I mean, our standard precautions used to be gloves or uh, hand washing, but now it's moved on to cough etiquette uh, and maybe masks as well, right? So that that's all brand new, and and we should think about that going forward because many of our pandemics are viral and respiratory illnesses, and and so um, part of standard precautions probably will be uh, some sort of um, uh, mouth or nose covering. Um, to prevent mucosal entrance. So it really does kind of, it, it's compounding and it's additive. And I think as, the, as, as new experiences come by, we, 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 we supplement what we thought we knew. Um, and so I think that'll be important. So, so um, definitely infection prevention is our, our key role. 
What surprised you the most about, the pa- I mean, everybody was surprised by this pandemic, but what surprised you the most about the response to the pandemic, both in New Zealand and in the United States? Yes, um, different things surprise me of different areas. We all have seen apocalyptic movies and and things like that. And and it always seems like the world comes together when there's a a common threat. And for some reason, I didn't get that feeling. I thought that if anything, we became as divisive. And so that was really disheartening because if anything, I thought all our differences would go away for at least a second and let's get together and combat this virus. And I didn't get that sense. Um, In New Zealand, though, I do believe there was um, some more commonality and and some more union as to the um, getting together towards it. And even here, there are differences politically and and different parties, et cetera. And still, despite that, everyone uh, came together to to address the the threat. So that was that was important to see. Restored my 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 faith um, a little bit to see that kind of response here. When do you think we'll ever get back to normal? What will, what will normal look like? So I think normal won't be the pre-normal, the pre-COVID era for quite some time. I know people were really waiting for January or, or just a new year and kind of a new slate. I don't think it'll be that quick, um, but eventually it will. Uh, I think we will learn to live with the virus for some time. I think even if a vaccine came about, it would be many months to to a year before we had um, enough people vaccinated that it would make a difference. And even still, it wouldn't change the infection prevention and standard precautions because no vaccine is 100% or at least until now, unless something changes with with the advances in research now. But I don't expect it to be 100% uh, effective. So we'll still have to rely on on standard precautions. Um, And so there are still many unknowns. I I anticipate that this will be a couple of years of dealing with this and and changing our world and, and having to evolve, having to evolve with our new normal. Does it worry you that the guidelines seem to change almost daily and some of the things that infection preventions have been teaching their fellow healthcare workers to do, all of a sudden the rule book kind of got thrown out the window and does it concern you that now you're gonna to have to re-educate people to uh, follow the guidelines, uh, wear, wear the PPE and uh, not reuse it and, and that sort of thing? Right, well, what concerns me is that people didn't expect that. I mean, that is the norm. That's when something's new, you're going to learn and change and learn and change and learn and change until you finally get it. There is no way that we could have known what we know today, six months ago or nine months ago. Um, So of course things are gonna change. What's striking and what's concerning is that it's so difficult to, 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 to have changed the minds of people once you've said something. It's almost like it just ruins your credibility from the get-go, when in reality, it should be actually helping because imagine we were still saying the things we were saying nine months ago, right? So, so that part is a bit concerning. And believe me, a lot of my day is spent in, in re-educating and, and kind of re-changing the, the dogma of yesterday, which is no longer. Uh, unfortunately, with this, um, it, it would be wrong to not change our minds uh, every so often. So I think it, we just have to keep going, keep going, keep learning, and eventually uh, we will learn more about COVID. And I think that will be the new normal when we finally have a better understanding of transmission, management, who gets infected and who gets really uh, sick, for example, all of these things will really be part of our new normal, and then we'll be able to deal with this virus properly without having it affect uh, economy and having shutting down cities and things like that. Do you see infection preventionists, or at least infection prevention expertise, migrating out of the hospitals and healthcare systems more and into the general public of the yes. industry? Thank you for asking that. Yes, indeed. Um, it actually started um, for, for me, for example, just to give an example and uh, the few colleagues that I speak to, it started as really a kind of a friendly um, advice uh, from uh, friends that were either on school boards or executive boards of companies or corporate areas or law firms, et cetera, just how do we come back and how do we reopen our, our workplace? Um, and we really started to see how 
how infection prevention is see the world in a different way. We walk around and we see risk everywhere. And we're always managing that balance of risk benefit. And, and so it, it really became something, a, a skill that was very, very useful outside of the hospital. And I guess really we never thought about it. A lot of us apply it at home. Um, for example, I always wash my produce with soap when I come home from the from the supermarket. That was pre-COVID anyway. But that was so little things that you do that were just kind of automatic because we were used to dealing with the microbial layer of things um, that have really resonate, uh, resonated with the corporate world and outside in the private sector. So I think that it'll be very important. For, I think now infection prevention should be part of a school board should be part of any executive board of any corporate area because there there is no way that you can expect uh, this expertise to just come about um, uh, for, for other folks that aren't trained in infection prevention. Are there enough infection preventions to go around for such an expansion and if not how would they how would you add to the ranks of infection preventions? Yes um, I would imagine that there aren't enough of us to go around, but um, but there are some companies that are um, getting folks together and creating webinars and, and things like that and doing some education. It's really difficult also um, because every uh, area is different. Every workplace is different and the parameters might be the same. So there might be two or three things that you have to adhere to, the hand washing, social distancing, et cetera, staying home when you're ill and how to bring folks back after they've been sick, right? So there might be some clear guidelines to that, but how you apply it to your workplace is going to be be totally different depending on your area. And it's not wrong, it's just that there are many ways to skin the cat, as they say. So it is important um, to do maybe a run through and, and have someone just kind of evaluate your workflow and see where you where there are uh, places that you can intervene. And that could be very uh, specific to a place. So I, I see this as, as uh, an opportunity to grow. Long-term care facilities have been particularly the nexus, nexus of this uh, of this disease, and they've been arguably unfairly blamed for for not being prepared. But they they don't they'll respond. They simply don't have the resources that an acute care hospital has. Uh, do you think after this is over, there'll be a push to make sure that a full time infection preventionist is on the staff of every nursing home or other long term care facility? Yes, I, I think so. It's um, even with flu season every year, this is there are many things that we're doing now for COVID that when we think back, we think, well, why weren't we doing this anyway also, right? So it's just a lot of complacency when something is, when you, when you have a vaccine, when you have antivirals, when you have management uh, control of something, it becomes, a, you become complacent. This is for sure. So I think this is a time when we should relearn these processes and remember how important they really are. Also that learning curve when a new uh, pandemic comes about really highlights our, our vulnerabilities. Um, and we see now how important for healthcare workers it is to keep this in mind. Otherwise, this is why we, we're the most to get sick initially because we're just, we're right in the trenches and we're just learning and we don't have all the parameters. And it becomes this really vulnerable period for the healthcare worker as well, or uh, groups of, of uh, vulnerability like the um, elderly and long-term care facilities. So, um, um, yes, this, this definitely has to be something thought of. Having said that, um, every pandemic is different. And, and next time we might be dealing with a totally different organism that is not transmitted through droplet or, or uh, respiratory droplets. So um, it'll change our policy again. It's just a constant surveillance, really. Dr. Daly Restrepo, thank you so much for visiting Infection Control today. Thank you for having me and have a nice day. You too. And good luck in your worthy endeavors. Thank you.